Thank you very, very much, uh, President Grimson. I, I, I was feeling it. I want to make sure it won't melt like the rest of the ice. Uh, Mr. President, the distinguished ministers, distinguished guests all, uh, I think you can hear from my voice <clears throat> that uh, uh, I'm suffering a little bit from a cold and from too many airplanes. But uh, I want you to know that this morning when I arrived, uh, there was less voice. And I immediately said, where can I go? I got to see somebody. And so I have put to test Iceland's healthcare system this morning. Um, I went up on the hill to the only clinic open in Reykjavik. And I dutifully paid my whatever and sat down. I was number eight in line. And the computer system was working, and I watched the number eight tick up, five, six, seven. Ultimately, it got to eight. I said, great, I'm going to go in. But they were very clever. They, they got you into another hall where there's another computer with another screen. And you look, <laughs> and you're still waiting. But it went very, very quickly. Uh, I want you to know this presentation today is a test of Iceland's medical care. And uh, <laughs> assuming, assuming I make it to the end, and you can still understand me, we're going to be world renowned here. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for your very uh, generous words. Uh, perhaps much more importantly, thank you for your leadership of the Arctic Circle, uh, your leadership of this beautiful and still somewhat fragile country. Um, I think everybody in your land reveres you still. Uh, and uh, it's a great privilege for me to receive this award from you. I thank you. I want you all to know also I am, our family is married into Iceland. Uh, my stepson, Andre, married an Icelander a few years ago. Um, and I had the privilege of presiding over the ceremony. It was wonderful. I learned an Icelandic cheer or two that date all the way back to the Vikings. Uh, and we sounded like them. Uh, but it was very, very special. And, and her name is Maria Martins Dottir. And it's a great privilege for us to be linked by family as well as by other ties. This prize is, is genuinely an honor, a great honor. And not just because of the service that, that uh, President Grimson uh, described to you. Uh, and not just because it is a beautiful piece of art, and it is, as is this building, by the way, which is an extraordinary building. But I value this because it is given to me here at this meeting, where so many of you have assembled to think about where we are and where we have to go because this is an award that is given to me by people who are still in the fight. And that matters to me. It means this award is not just something to put on a shelf and admire for things done. It is a reminder of the urgency of the work that we have yet to do. And so I thank you very, very much for that. Uh, President Grimson, maybe 10 years ago, reminded all of us of a sort of triplex threat that we face, all of which is interconnected. The global economy, uh, the need for a green energy revolution, and the challenge of climate change. And he said that each of them is so connected that unless we have the ability to be able to solve one, you can't solve any of them. They're all interconnected in that way. And that's precisely where we are today. It was true in 2009. It's even more true in 2019. And nowhere is it felt more than in the Arctic. As Secretary of State, uh, I traveled above the Arctic Circle. I traveled to Svalbard. I went with my good friend, Borger Brenda, the Norwegian foreign minister. And we spent a couple of days up there, ships going up to the glaciers, watching what was happening, listening to the scientists. And the scientists there said to me, Mr. Secretary, if you really want to understand what's happening with climate change, you have to go to Antarctica. And so I went back to Washington and told my staff, we're going to Antarctica. And indeed, 
uh, I flew out, I voted by absentee ballot, I flew out on the very election day in the United States, and learning the news I learned flying over the Pacific, we almost thought we'd stay in the Antarctic. Um, but I decided, obviously, to come back for the fight. Um, but in the Antarctic, it was magical. I mean, I've never seen wilderness like that. I'd never, and I've been to wilderness. I've been in Canada, I've been in many different places, but this was, there was something eerily grounding in this. And the uh, first-hand impact of climate change that was being described to me by the, what, nearly 20-plus scientists from each of 20-plus countries that go there to do research chilled me in terms of, beyond the cold, in terms of uh, what we're facing. I was at ground zero for climate change at McMurdo Station. And as I listened to these scientists from all over the world and looked at chart after chart where they traced what has been happening, describing the latest deeply alarming evidence of what is going on, uh, I was generally scared. How do you translate this into a language that the average citizen can understand and connect to? I flew by helicopter over the great West Antarctic ice sheet, which now people say is threatened to perhaps break off or slide down and go off into the ocean to melt. I learned how the warmer water is spilling over the continental shelf and churning below the ice and creating instability in it. Uh, I walked out under the Ross Sea ice sheet and looked out towards the ocean. Uh, and the researchers did not mince their words. A scientist from New Zealand named Gavin Dunbar uh, described what they're seeing as an unmistakable canary in the coal mine. And he warned that some thresholds, if we cross them, cannot be reversed. Now, I've been in public life for a fair number of years. Served as prosecutor, lieutenant governor, senator, and then secretary of state. And what I always learned is that public people have a responsibility to serve the public good. And that if you are given certain choices and evidence with respect to policies, there's an obligation to execute what's called the precautionary principle. We buy insurance in our homes. We buy insurance cars. We buy fire insurance. We buy various kinds, life insurance. And given the evidence that we have, it is even more compelling that we should be buying insurance for planet Earth. But we're not. The Arctic is warming faster today than any other region on Earth. There are places in the Arctic where today it's already at two degrees. And temperatures are increasing more than twice the rate of the global average. It was above freezing in the Arctic last year in February. And the Arctic is melting now four times faster than it was 10 years ago. We had the hottest July we've ever had in measurable human history. We had the hottest single day in July that we've ever had in human history. And this July contributed to the hottest year in human history, which is part of the hottest decade in human history. And the decade before that was the second hottest. And the decade before that was the third hottest. And you'd think that people who see this and what is happening would have an understanding of the urgency of public people coming together in order to do what we said we would do in Paris, what we fought to do even in Rio, where I was, or in Kyoto, where I was, or all of the other negotiations we have had through the years. The ability of future generations to be able to adapt and live and prosper in the Arctic in the way that people have for thousands of years is in jeopardy as we gather here. Now, over the last three decades, both the increase in temperature and the corresponding decrease in ice observed in the Arctic are at an unprecedented level, at least in the 1,500 years that we're capable of measuring. We're still struggling with black carbon emissions, which most of you here have seen with your own eyes. A pollutant that is up to 2,000 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Everybody knows this dark soot that collects on the surface of the snow, which is visible to the, to the eye. 
has covered sea ice as well. And what happens is, is it, it's dark, attracts the sunlight, contains the heat, melts, forms a blanket over the ice. And guess what? It doesn't take a PhD to know that the combination of heat and ice produces melting. Pretty fundamental. But we have 130 climate deniers in the United States Senate. We have a president of the United States who wants to tell people it is a Chinese hoax. My friends, uh, we have to face facts. I had a colleague in the United States Senate called Daniel Patrick Moynihan, distinguished UN representative and senator from New York, and he had a famous saying. He said, everybody is entitled to their own opinion, but you are not entitled to your own facts. And one of the challenges we face in democracies across this planet today is the fact that there's no, there's no baseline of truth anymore. There's no referee for that truth anymore. People can lie, and they do. As Mark, Mark Twain once said, a lie can travel halfway around the world before the truth even gets its boots on. But now, a lie can travel around the world with the push of a button, and it does. So, If we want to know where the problem is, we have to look in the mirror. Here we are, we know what the science tells us to do, and yet we're still struggling to achieve the full framework implementation of the uh, action enhanced black carbon, methane emissions. And it's not just the air that is under assault, my friends. It's the water, the oceans that are under attack, which is why I started the Our Oceans Conference in 2014, and we went to Chile, and we came back to Washington because we wanted to put a firm imprint on this process. And then it went to Malta with Europe, and from there to Bali, and now to Norway in a week or two, and then to Palau, and onwards. So we've created something that's sustaining. The fact is that what's happening in the oceans is a threat every day to the food chain for more than a billion people on the planet who get their protein from fish. But it's also a threat for all of us, wherever you live, because of the coral bleaching, because of the rise of acidity, because of the changes in currents, the changes in El Nino, the climate changes that are impacted by it, the increased moisture because of the heating of the ocean, which increases storm intensity. Uh, we've taken some strides. I'm not standing up here to say that, I mean, every one of you is working at this. We're trying. We're just not trying hard enough, frankly. And we're not yet getting the job done. Now, when it comes to the stewardship of the Arctic Ocean, we've all worked to promote a pan-Arctic pan -Arctic network of marine protected areas and to safeguard areas that are particularly significant, both culturally and ecologically. And over the last five years, guess what? We have made billions of dollars of commitments. The first meeting in Washington, we got five to six billion in commitments. By 2016, we had over 10 billion in commitments, many of them from people like Rob Walton and the Walton Foundation of Walmart, or the, the Pew Foundation, or the Hewlett Packard Foundation. Charity is stepping up and has increasingly. But we still have a problem. And Iceland understands this problem and has done something really good about it. Too much money chasing too few fish. Now, Iceland's been sustainable, set an example to the world. Indonesia's working to do this. Other places are fighting to do it. But I got news for you folks. The late Ted Stevens, a good friend of his is here. He and I worked together on the fisheries subcommittee of the Senate. We went to the United Nations in the 1990s to ban drift net fishing. We succeeded. We did ban it. But today we have pirates out there on the vast, unregulated high seas. And those pirates not only deal in narcotics and human trafficking and gun smuggling, but they're involved in facilitating overfishing. Small little boats that go out from the big mothership, which is out in the non-jurisdiction, non-enforced high seas. And they rush into the economic zone, strip mine the place, and come out. And the fact is that 
Nearly 60% of global fish stocks are still fished at their maximum levels. 33% are overfished and in need of recovery. So we're not winning this right now. I'm sorry to say that to you, but I'm, I, I think, but I'm an optimist about our ability to, and I'll share that with you. But first, I want to tell you why we're not winning. We're not winning when the World Bank tells us that poor fishery management costs countries $83 billion a year in lost revenue. Certainly not winning when climate change itself is changing the basic chemistry of the ocean, and we're seeing changes take in spawning grounds, mangrove, in low-lying areas, various fisheries. We, we, we've lost some of our fisheries in New England. It's gone north. We now have 200 white sharks, great whites, where there was nary a shark previously. We see a threatening of marine life that may simply die because it can no longer survive in the very waters that have nourished it since time began. And there are more than 500 dead zones throughout the ocean, areas where life simply cannot exist because there's no oxygen, because of nitrate overload and other developmental uh, consequences of non-source point pollution. 51% of the oxygen that we breathe comes from the ocean. You want to watch that equation change? The damage has now reached such an extreme level, my friends, that unless we change our practices by the middle of this century, there will be definitively more plastic in the oceans than there are fish. Now, as we know well, those of us gathered here, in the American Arctic summer, sea ice could well disappear, according to most predictions, by mid-century and increase the vulnerability of communities in the Arctic in a system as a consequence of coastal erosion. And as the permafrost thaws, which we're now seeing at an alarming increasing rate, I mean, you've seen the pictures of scientists lighting a match over the ocean where the methane bubbles are coming up, or you've seen it uh, in terms of land likewise, or some places where methane comes out of somebody's faucet. But as the permafrost thaws at an alarming rate, we're, we're witnessing more and more wildfires, collapsing infrastructure, and the potential release of vast amount of greenhouse gases that only speed up warming because methane, as we know, is 20 times more potent in the damage that it does in, than CO2. Not as long lasting, I agree, but lasting long enough given the challenge of the budget that we have for carbon today as we press on towards mid-century, We've got to be mindful of these sources, too. Iceland also understands as the Arctic glaciers, the Greenland ice sheet shrinks substantially faster, driving global sea level rise faster. That, in turn, unleashes flooding and storm surges, causing immeasurable harm not only to Arctic communities, but to urban and rural communities along every coastal site in the ocean. When I talked to Tommy Remengensal, the president of Palau, he says to me, you know, Mr. Secretary, I used to be talking about mitigation and adaptation with my people, but I can't do that anymore. I have to talk about where we're going to move to, a whole nation state in the Pacific. So as all of you understand, because you've come here, you're here, this is not a future challenge. This is happening right now. People are dying around the world because of climate change. I see it in my country. Floods in mid part of our country that wiped out farms. Fires even now in California. Mudslides that swallowed up whole homes and people. Floods that have likewise taken life. In three storms alone, we spent $265 billion just to clean up after the storms. Harvey dropped more water in five days on Houston, Texas, than flows over Niagara Falls in an entire year. Irma had the first measurement of sustained winds over 185 miles an hour for 24 hours, ever. Now we've had a second one with Dorian. And Maria destroyed a lot of Puerto Rico, still struggling. And you've seen what's happened to the Bahamas. This is real, and it requires real leadership not the mouthing of pretty words, not more meetings where people talk about We understand this. How can the G20 meet when the Amazon is burning, 
And the most they come up with is $20 million to deal with the Amazon. When the pledge in Paris was $100 billion for the Green Climate Fund in order to do the mitigation and transfer to leapfrog those less developed countries into the future without making the mistakes that we made in the Industrial Revolution and beyond. So uh, we're on a dangerous path. I guess that's pretty evident to everybody here. But here's the magic. Here's the part that drives me so uh, obviously frustrated and, and even somewhat angry about it. I get angry when I look at what public responsibility is supposed to be, and I don't see people doing it. That's why Greta Thunberg's out there. That's why kids are out there. That's why there's a climate strike today. But those kids don't have a vote in any boardroom. They don't have a vote in the floor of the United States Congress. We have all these deniers. They don't have a vote in, you know, as corporate shareholders. They're just looking at the facts, and they're speaking truth to power. You cannot protect the oceans, my friends, without dealing with climate change. And you cannot deal with climate change without dealing with the oceans. You don't have to be a scientist or a leader of government to understand that the reason you're all here sitting here is because time is running out. Now, obviously, we've got to help people find a way forward, even at a time when the forces of delay and distortion uh, have, 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 and denial have actually um, tapped into something that's very deep and disturbing in the politics of the world today. I just want to take a tiny moment to think about that. I mean, we see what's happened in Italy, we see France, we see Orban in Hungary, uh, we see the dynamics of Brexit, and we see the dynamics in my country today. So, we're living in the midst of global change on a scale and scope of the Industrial Revolution in its impact. But it, unlike the Industrial Revolution, what is happening today is happening at digital pace. It's a different animal. And all around the world, what I hear from people, and I travel around the world, a privilege to be able to meet with leaders and help try to push this issue forward, as I meet with them, I find there's a challenge to governance itself in far too many countries that matter. And citizens understand that. They're feeling completely angry. The 2008 crash of the financial system has left wounded in our economic system even today. People who are downsized, harder to make the money, harder to feel it's fair, harder to feel how globalization is helping them, harder to latch on to the dream. Harder to pay the bills. And that's measured against a reality that in the United States of America, 51% of all the income of our country is now going to 1% of our citizens. That's not a sustainable equation. Talk about sustainable politics. But that's repeated in many other parts of the world where people don't feel they're getting their part of this rising tide. So, in that kind of a political environment, we saw in the last century, particularly with World War II, what happens when you combine demagoguery with tougher economic times and extremism. And it's not a good picture, not a good history. That's why the EU came together. That's why we created the UN. That's why we created NATO. That's why we had a, a, a vision of a set of values around which we're going to organize our lives, no greater value than organizing your life than to make sure you don't kill the planet and everybody with it. So, my friends, we're living uh, at a critical moment when the environment itself has been turned into a political and economic weapon, and lies are being told. We need to prove the opposite. We need to change the language and change the battleground that good governing is good economics, that solving climate change is the way not just to save lives and stop its geopolitical fallout, it's the way to create the jobs of the future, definitively. Solar is now 89% cheaper than it was a few years ago. 
Wind is 69% cheaper than it was a few years ago. Fastest growing job in the United States of America, solar power technician. Second fastest growing job, wind turbine technician. Two years ago in America, when we left office, 75% of the new electricity that came online in the US, notwithstanding what you hear about the direction the president wants to take it, came from solar power. You know what coal was? 0.23%. No bank in America will fund a new coal power plant today. And frankly, that's the way it ought to be all around the world. So we've got a challenge ahead of us. But our institutions, both domestic and global, frankly, need to update themselves a little bit. Everything's moving faster in this world we live in now. Goods move faster. Ideas move faster. People move faster. Everything's moving faster except for one thing, governance. Our country is not moving at all. We're not building any great infrastructure project of consequence, let alone a national grid, which is imperative to be able to send energy from one place to another. So this is what I think leadership is supposed to be about. The world, and certainly my country, I speak for my own, has got to break out of this thing. We met in Paris a number of years ago. I had the privilege of leading those negotiations for the United States, as, as President Eric Grissom mentioned. And I'll tell you, we, we did our homework. Within six weeks of my being appointed Secretary of State, I went to China. I met with President Xi. And I said, we can't afford another Copenhagen where the President of the United States is chasing after the President of China in a hallway trying to meet. And you're leading the G77 to be opposed to everything we're doing. You got citizens in your country who care about the water and care about the air. air. I know this, because as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, I'd traveled there and heard it. I said, we need to respond to those needs. Let's work together. And guess what? President Xi accepted the challenge. One year later, President Obama and President Xi were able to stand up together not unlike what happened down that little house down the road here in Reykjavik when Gorbachev and Reagan came out and surprised the world and said, we're going to stop having 50,000 warheads facing each other. We're going to go in another direction. And we did. And today we have 1,500, still too many, but a less dangerous place than it was when we had 50,000. That's what we have to do here, folks. And so we need to... Uh, so, so President Xi and President Obama stood up in the Great Hall of the People, and they announced each of them what each of our countries would do to go to Paris and reduce our emissions. We put our plans on the table almost two years ahead of time. That's when Europe began to follow and other countries. We were able to bring India and Saudi Arabia and other difficult countries to the table at that moment. We created mission innovation with China and India which is supposed to be pushing the technology curve so that we're exploring everything like net negative emissions technology, which you're practicing right here. I just met with your president, and he told me about what you're doing with carbon dioxide and turning it into stone. These are the kinds of things we got to be pushing and exploring to a fairly well, not ignoring our pledges of $100 billion. So folks, we know the arguments. We know the facts. We know the issues. Uh, and I think that uh, we have to recognize that, that, that uh, whether we break out of this procrastination, which is not your proclivity, I know it, but it's just there. We can't wait around for everybody else to do it. We have to all do it ourselves and now. I think we're staring at the greatest opportunity we ever had. That's the argument I made in Paris. There is a solution to climate change, correct? The solution is energy policy. And by and large, we have most of the tools, not all. We still have baseload challenges. We still have to figure out battery storage. The person who is the next Sergey Brin or Bill Gates who comes up with 25, 30 days of battery storage, we won the battle. Game over the minute that happens. But there are all kinds of other things we can do. 
Different fuels yet to be discovered. Maybe hydrogen can be brought to scale and be safe. Maybe fusion will finally be the dream that comes across the line. But it'll never happen if we don't put Russia, China, US, France, Germany, Britain, Finland, all the European countries together in a huge challenge, like going to the moon or inventing the internet. That's what we have to do now. I have confidence in our ability to do that. I'm confident we're going to do it. I know what people are doing right now. I have friends who are in venture capital who made a lifetime now of doing things, and they're leaving their firms, and I'm going to devote everything I do now to climate change. There are people who are going to be pouring, Eric Schmidt from Google, you know, John Doerr from Kleiner Perkins. And I know what Bill Gates is doing right now with respect to his private wealth in order to funnel it into whether it's fourth generation modular nuclear or whatever it's going to be. We can do this. And this is the argument I made in Paris. I said to the delegates, nobody should leave Paris believing that we have guaranteed the world that we are keeping global climate change rise to two degrees, let alone 1.5, because we're not. And that's why I, I bristle a little bit when I hear everybody say, well, we got to get back to Paris. Yeah, we do. But that's not enough. If we did everything that is contained in the plans put forward in Paris, we are still at 3.7 degrees centigrade increase. And in fact, we're not only not going to do that, we are heading today, if you do business as usual today forward, we're heading to four to four and a half degrees right now. So why am I optimistic? Here's why I'm optimistic. The energy market is the largest market the world has ever known. In Massachusetts, my state with MIT and Harvard and other people, we were pushing the curve of discovery in, 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 in the 1990s. And two major items, telecommunications and desk computers, drove the technology bubble of that time. And we created a lot of millionaires in a lot of parts of our country, Texas, California, Massachusetts, et cetera. You know what? It was a $1 trillion market with 1 billion users. The energy market today is a multi-trillion dollar market. It's going to grow to 20, 30, 40 trillion dollars that everybody knows is going to be spent. It's a 4 to 5 billion user market today. A billion people in the world don't have any electricity at all. That's an opportunity. And if we do what we know we can do, we will meet the challenge of 9.7 billion people on this planet 30 years from now. That's why it's the biggest opportunity and biggest market the world has ever seen. Greatest manufacturing market opportunity. We can solve climate change at the same time. Think of this also. US is 15% of all emissions. China's 25% of all emissions. Europe's about 14% of all emissions. Put it together, you're well over 50%, close to 60. Just three of us on this planet. When you add the rest of the G20, you're up to almost all emissions, most of them. 130 nations, 138 nations, are all below 1.1 in fractions. So 20 nations could have come to New York a week ago with the right leadership and up their ante for next year. Could have upped the goals for the negotiation that will take next year, but it didn't happen. No wonder citizens are suspicious of us. No wonder kids are striking. No wonder you're going to see people marching, getting arrested, shutting down communities, because they're demanding the fundamentals of politics everywhere, that the people in charge respond to the felt needs of a nation. So I thank you profoundly for this, but I'll tell you what I'm about to do. I'm going to be announcing a new effort, uh, which is going to try to marry the top roots and the grassroots. And I've enlisted uh, the former governor of California, who did a lot on climate, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I've enlisted Christine Todd Whitman, the former governor of New Jersey and the head of our EPA, and Ernie Moniz, the Energy, former energy secretary of our country. And we've got admirals and generals and former national security personnel and scientists. And we are going to start an effort that 
communicates to our country with other leaders in other countries managing their countries in an effort called World War Zero. The effort to globally recognize there's only a world solution to this war, because I'll tell you what, the purveyors of doubt and lies and distortion have declared war on common sense and science. And we need to fight back in order to do this just like we did in World War II when we decided we had to win. There's a book out by Paul Kennedy, a professor at Yale, called Engineers of Victory. It talks about the four or five key decisions that had to be made to win. We need to make decisions like that with the automakers, with the utilities, with the public builders. Bring them in to the places of leadership and build the response that the people of the world rightfully demand from their leaders. Please don't tell me this is impossible because it is not impossible. Nelson Mandela used to say that the, they always say it's impossible until it is done. Remember also what Muhammad Ali said, impossible is not a fact, it is an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration, it is a dare. So my friends, this meeting here in Iceland and every meeting we have after this must be taken as a dare. Every single one of us has to make the impossible, not just possible, but make it inevitable. Thank you for the privilege of this award.